Was that was that your intro? We we live. That, here? That's that's my intro. Actually, I was yelling at my children to stop <laughs> trying to break in the door. Hey, GBC family, <laughs> what's up? We're so glad yeah. you're here. We think you're here. Yeah. For those of y'all that uh, are watching live or will be watching live, we appreciate y'all tuning in. We hope that you'll uh, not only stay connected during the conversation, but you'll pull out your Bible. For the conversation, uh, click that like button and the share button at the bottom of your screen, and we'd appreciate that. Did you know that, matter of fact, Mary Beth posted this on the Grace Bible page Hold on. today. That, I, mi I, I misspelled the word conversation in the title of our post. Okay, well then I'll wait to share it because I don't want that atrocity. Yeah, I'm not going to be page. a piece until I fix that. Hold up. <laughs> you can get back to what you was talking about, though. Well, I was just observing that we had posted on our GBC page earlier today via Miss Mary Beth that today is National Hammock Day. Hammock. Hammock. L lay back and relax. You ever, uh, you ever took a nap in a hammock before? I could sleep anywhere. But have you ever been in a hammock before? Oh, I've been in a hammock before. I'm not really a, a kind of top heavy. And my equilibrium is easily thrown off. So, <laughs> you have a hard time getting in. <laughs> getting out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, I've never oh, taken yeah. a nap in a hammock before. Oh, man. Nowadays, you can buy these. I forget what they call them. But they're like these hammocks that you pack into this little bitty pack, man. You can just clip it on your backpack when you go camping or whatever and just throw it up on a tree. They're pretty cool. I've camped out with a couple of those before. It's been a long time since I've gotten in like a good rope one, you know, hanging between two oak trees. Yeah. I'm trying to pay attention to you, but I'm also trying to I fix know. this. Well, and that's probably what everybody else at home is saying right now, too, is uh It's like Cameron's not, not really interested. here. Why isn't Cameron here? They're looking yeah. at that misspelled word that I just wrote. Cameron is working on finishing posting this properly, and then we'll get into Colossians chapter 3 really Verse 17 is where we're going to camp out. Let me, uh, if you're watching, though, we appreciate y'all tuning in, being part of the beginning of the conversation. I'm going to ask you to do what I'm about to do, and that's go to uh, the bottom of your screen there and click the share button. Um, that will put it on your page, um, and that'll hopefully encourage some of your friends, family, followers, whoever scrolls across your page tonight, maybe they'll tune in or maybe they'll check it out at a later time. That's cool too. You know, uh, man, the Lord, here we go. The Lord's not going to let me fix that, bro. Oh, really? Well, I tell you what, uh, JJ and Mary Beth are watching in from the outside. One of them may fix it for us. Y'all are going to have to go and change that. I, I misspelled conversation and like, I, I just, I, I think it's going to grieve the Holy Spirit tonight if we don't fix that. <laughs> No, yeah. I'm just hey there, uh, Bo Ro. I see you, Miss Carol. Bruce, so Vicky, glad. we oh. miss you guys. Bruce and That's Vicky right. Davis. Oh, how, all the way from PA. I bet the weather's a lot nicer up there in the evening than it is here. Hey, Mary Jacobs. Thanks for tuning in this evening. We are glad you guys are here. Yeah, please go like this, share this. Even though you're going to be sharing an error, uh, I spelled the word conversation wrong. I really should let it go. Um, and I yeah, will. Yeah, I yeah. will. Maybe we should pray. Maybe, hey there. You know what? We didn't pray. That's hey there, Pixie, Janice. Hey, Miss Jan. Uh, yeah, we need to pray. Yeah, we do. Judley. We do. We do. Let's do that. Lead, uh, lead the way, brother. Why don't you? Okay, oh, I, will. I should. I, will. I don't know. You want paper, rock, scissors? I'll do it. it? I'll do it. Right. You seem a bit disoriented if you misspelled such simple word. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for... Uh, Thank you for your word. I thank you that you have gifted us with the words of God, mm. um, that we are not a, a people uh, who are having to try to wonder uh, what the mind of God is like and what the heart of God longs for. Lord, you've declared it throughout the generations, and you've given it to us in written form, in a language that we can understand so that we can press into it uh, so that you can reveal yourself to us um, through your written word. I pray, God, that you would, in fact, do that, that you would just illuminate uh, your words to us tonight, that they would transform and change our hearts once and for all. Lord, that we would be a worshipful people, um, that we would worship, in fact, in everything that we do. 
And Lord, uh, guide our conversation. Uh, if we chase a rabbit, may it be yours. Mm. Lord, if we hang out in a certain area of conversation, may that be the place that you have us. This is yours. These are your people. And this is your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. There's a couple times throughout the conversation tonight, guys, that we hope to uh, get some involvement. And uh, Rhonda Beckman says, just let it go, Cameron. Well, I'll tell you what. What's up, Mama Ryan? It's good to see you. Listen here, y'all. Uh, um, Mary, Mary Beth, yeah. our Momentum Director, she just texted me that it's fixed, and I can now focus. It is. And so, you know what? Okay, it takes good. a village <laughs> to fix my poor That's grammar. Right. So thank you, guys. <laughs> We're thankful. we got a good team at GBC. <laughs> hey, if you're just signing in, thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in to be a part of this conversation. Uh, hey, Lloyd Nina. Hey, Daisy. Yeah, we're glad that y'all are here with us. How many, and, how many um, shares we got? Let's get legalistic on these folk. Okay, well, let me hit refresh real quick. I'm just, we're going to do I'm just playing. one last pause. I promise we're going to get in the conversation. Open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. It, it looks like, if my statistics are correct, um, we've got about uh, 47 people watching, and nine of them have shared. Wow, nine. How about... How about if you're watching? How how are we going to motivate them? The share button for Let's motivate them with the gospel to share. Okay, gospel fluent that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thus say it. Now let me stop. That's dangerous. Let me not. Let me not go there. <laughs> now we're just playing. Hey, we'd love for you to share. We'd love for this conversation to jump on the feeds of all of your friends who are mindlessly scrolling. But in the meantime, Colossians right. chapter three. Uh, tonight we're attempting to cover ten whole verses. Ten, like, dude, I don't think we've. I don't think we've gotten past two or three for the last couple of months, so that is a uh, that's a lot of real estate. You think we're going to be able to do it? Well, I know that the bulk of the conversation we're going to have revolving around seventeen ought to be good. So All right. we'll see if we make it out of there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we just got permission that is a by Dustin to not need to get to all 10, but hey, we're going to shoot for the stars tonight. Colossians three yeah. seventeen. We're looking to try to get all the way to chapter four, verse one. But of course, we need to recap just uh, a little bit. The last two weeks, we've been camped out on a few different ideas of letting the life of Christ be active in our lives in some certain and some specific ways. Verse 15, we were admonished by the Apostle Paul to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. To let the peace of Christ mm. literally umpire and referee. I mean, I hope that I hope that analogy, that that word picture has been a helpful uh, image for you as you have found yourself kind of not at peace in the midst of some relationships over the last couple of weeks. But literally that word peace is a phrase that was a sports term, the idea of the, the peace of Christ ruling and um umpiring, stepping in and taking the striped shirt and the whistle and ruling, making a rule towards peace and harmony within the body of Christ. And why, why is that to be done specifically in the body of Christ? Because if we can't figure out how to love one another in the faith, especially in the midst of relational conflict, how in the world are we going to be able to work through relational conflict with folks who don't believe what we believe, who don't subscribe to a Christian worldview, who are not indwelt by the Spirit of God. And so we've got to figure out how to live in harmony with one another as the people of God. Uh, and the way that we do that ultimately is by allowing the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts. Thoughts on that, D, before we keep going? No, I, I would encourage you, though, uh, if you didn't tune in on that conversation, all you got to do is go to the Grace Bible Facebook page and just scroll back YouTube a couple well. of weeks. It's on the YouTube You'll see page. the same... It's on our YouTube channel as well. Yeah, yeah, you'll see the same split screen, live stream. Do you, you remember? We probably titled it, May the, Let the Peace of Christ Rule in Your Hearts. Uh, nope, um, but we definitely dated it. And so it was two weeks ago. Okay. So if you want to go, it's it's under the Happy Easter After series. Uh, and you're going to find that two weeks ago. I don't have my calendar in front of me. I got me. it. Cool. So that would have been on July 8th. July 8th. Uh, we talked about the peace of Christ ruling in your heart. That, that conversational truly is is pivotal in the life of a Christian. Um, that is some everyday kind of practical biblical wisdom of learning how to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Because if you're anything like me, it is often that I can use an extra measure of peace. So I hope that you'll check that one out. You know, um, bef before we can even go on, I, I already have to like introduce a rabbit trail. You ready? Um, ready. I'm sorry, but 
let me let me share a bit of a revelation um, that I've had um, probably about six months ago. Here's the deal. Uh, like Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts just as you are called in one body. Like th- this entire chapter, specifically 15, 16, and 17, are rooted in our relationships in the body of Christ. And I kind of I said it just in passing in that introductory thought, but Paul's call for us to live in a relational harmony and unity is so important. Now, I think of John chapter, I think it was 1334, 1333, where Jesus tells the disciples after he's washed their feet and he gives them a new commandment to love uh, one another just as Christ has loved them. He says, the world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you what? By the way that you love Love one one another. another. The way that you love Mm -hmm. one another. And so uh, let me me share with you a, a bit of an aha moment for me. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments, Dustin, like you kind of knew this was coming, but kind of not. Like, So I'm the discipleship pastor, right? And kind of part of my job over the last, I don't know, two years has been, uh, alongside many other people, has been wrestling through our philosophy of ministry, right? Our discipleship strategy, our discipleship pathway, if you will. What does it mean for Grace Bible Church to make disciples? What will it look like for GBC to make disciples? What mechanisms and model, what environments and rhythms are we going to implement in order to help shift our church towards a greater commitment to the Great Commission? So that's kind of what my job has entailed. And so as I came to this passage, as I've been wrestling through the call of making disciples, I understood this passage in John 13. That's what I'm mentioning. John 13, that verse, verse 34, where Jesus reminds us, listen, we love one another. The world's going to know that we're his disciples by the way that we love one another. So when I came to that passage, I began to think, Okay, in, in terms of how we are to connect with one another as believers, like we need to create the kind of systems and environment so that Christians can gather together in community and learn to love one another before we ever try moving outward towards other people, before we try to go on mission as missionaries and the normal stuff of everyday life. And my rationale was, okay, if Jesus says that the world's going to know that we belong to his family by the way that we love one another, then our job as pastors is to help equip the saints for the work of the ministry in getting people together to start loving one another, pressing one another to growing in their identity in Christ, while learning to share life with one another and in community with one another. And and I think my thought was, once we figure out how to love one another, then... Then we can go on mission and share that love with other people. Does that make sense? But there's... it makes perfect sense to me, and it's it seems to be um, it seems to be to me God's strategy for the world to know that He is King by the unity of His body. Yeah. On Earth. Yeah. Because uh, that, that's not a new concept, and that wasn't just some New Testament gospel strategy. Jesus didn't come up with this brand new strategy of evangelism by getting Christian people to love one another well. That was God's same strategy in the Old Testament. Yeah. I mean, what are the two primary mechanisms that God used to assemble his people so that the world would long to be a part of that family? The two things, feasts and festivals. Yeah. Two celebrations Amen. to get to get the people of God together, to celebrate God together, to love each other together, and that the world would look on almost almost with like a, a holy jealousy, like mm. longing for that kind of belonging. And so when Jesus came onto the scene, what he did was he just modeled what it looked like. He spent his he spent his entire ministry with 12 guys, and those 12 guys spent most of their time with Jesus with other people, in homes having meals, Mm. uh, in parts of town that nobody else would have went to. No doubt. Just being with people so that the world would know. Jesus prayed in John 17 that the world would know that God had sent him into the world by the unity of the body. So there's just that's a thread from beginning to end of scriptures that when we dwell together in harmony— Romans 16, 12, yeah, yeah, yeah. the world will take notice because there is nothing like this. Yeah. There's nothing like the body of Christ in the rest of the world. So, so there's, 
there's been a hole though in my processing for the last year and a half because I, I, I thought incorrectly as well. I thought that, man, we need to create environments for our people, our GBC folks, to learn to live in community with each other and love one another and figure that out before they can go work and go on mission. And, and there's a hole in that. And, and let me tell you why. About, a, about six months ago, I was on the phone with a, with a ministry coach, and he relayed, I was relaying to him some of what I was pondering and wrestling through. And I was saying, listen, if Jesus says that we, we need to learn how to love one another before the world will ever see genuine, authentic, real life relationships, man, then I need to figure out ways to create those kinds of environments for our people to love one another. And he said, you know what? Like, I appreciate where you're going with that, but let, let me show you something. He took me over to Mark chapter one. And he showed me how Jesus called James and John, Andrew, Simon Peter and his brother uh, Andrew, and he called them to what? You know, repent, believe, and come and follow me. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, right? We all know that phrase and that passage. We actually, gosh, we preached a whole sermon series on that verse just a couple of months ago. Uh, but what blew my mind is then he took me to the very next chapter in Mark. Uh, in sequence, it's probably the next day or so. So these events are really close together. Jesus calls these good Jewish boys, um, and they do a bunch of ministry. And the next day or two days later, Jesus calls Matthew, the tax collector. And we read about this in Mark chapter 2, verse 13 and 15. And he goes to Matthew, and he calls Matthew to come and follow him. And the very next thing they do, you know what they do? They go to Matthew's house. And they have a party. They Peter, James, and John must have been thinking, right? Like, what did we do? Right? This can't be right. Like the, these were good Jewish boys who had <laughs> forsaken everything to follow Jesus. And the very next day, Jesus is calling a tax collector, and they end yeah. up at the tax collector's house feasting with sinners and tax collectors. And listen, if 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 the force of this is lost on you, then let me remind you what the full weight of a tax collector meant. A tax collector wasn't hated in the first century Palestine area because he took $20 when he should have took 10 and he stuck it in his pocket. Like a tax collector was hated because they purchased the rights from Rome to tax you to fund the oppressive regime that had moved into your land, pillaged your fields, were raping your daughters and wives and killing your sons. Mm -hmm. And somebody you know, your next door neighbor just purchased the rights to tax you to line the pockets of the Roman soldiers who were continually coming into your house and hurting your people and stealing your goods. Tax collectors it was weren't hated. The greatest hated. act of betrayal, man. It's, that'd have been by a neighbor. That'd have been the greatest act of betrayal by a neighbor. Can you imagine that? And so, and, and so, and then you couple that with. I'm sorry. No, no, ahead. no. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'll say you couple that with what it meant to have a meal. Like we meals mean something to us, even in our culture, but not to the gravity that it would have meant to them. Like if you go over and have a meal at somebody's house, it may be an acquaintance. You may be just getting to know each other or it may just be, I don't really care for that person, but I know it, you know, we, we got a business transaction in their world to have a meal together meant it communicated acceptance. They communicated family. I mean, you were very particular about who you invited over to your house back in those days because you would have been associated with those people out in the community. Yeah. And so now here, Peter, James, and John are following Jesus right into Matthew's house for a meal. Like, I didn't, you don't want to catch your car parked out in front of Matthew's house. You know, it's, it's even bigger you know? than that. When I had the privilege of going to Israel with Pastor Randy, and man, I can't wait till we start having that conversation again as a church. But when, yes. when we went to Israel with Pastor Randy and we went to the Sea of Galilee, when we went to have lunch that day, Randy didn't have lunch with us because he went to have lunch with some of his Jewish friends and they wouldn't eat lunch with us because they didn't know us. And lunch, breaking bread, having a meal was such an intimate engagement that there had to be a almost familial bond to be able yeah. to break bread with one another. Because why? Feasts and festivals, right? Like these were one yeah. of the fail-safe ways of communicating who we are as the people of God. And so here's what my, my friend told me on the other end of the phone as I was telling him, hey man, like I need to figure out how to get our Christian brothers and sisters to love one another before they can go love people who don't, know yet, don't yet know Jesus. And he said, Cameron, brother, look at this passage. 
we learn to love one another as the people of God. Not only in the comfort of our homes, around our couches, and our living room, dining room table, we learn to love one another in the fray on mission, serving together mm. those who are far from God, who don't have it all together, who need to see what real life expressed through redeemed children of God really looks like. And so Jesus basically said, James, John, Simon, Peter, y'all better pull it together. We're going into the lion's den and we're going to surround folks who don't yet know Jesus and we're going to party with them and we're going to show them what real life looks like because real life just showed up to the party. And so like, man, this entire passage of Colossians 3, it's all in the context of community. This yeah. is why you cannot be a Christ follower, a part of the body of Christ and say, I love Jesus. I just don't like people. I love Jesus. I'm just not into that church thing. I, I, have, yeah, yeah. I have church at home by myself and, by, and with my Jesus. Like th that, that doesn't work. And this isn't a call to come to Christian services or church services. This is a reminder that we truly were called as the people of God to live in community and on mission. And when we're on mission, guys, that's when the real stuff of life is going to bubble up. That's when we're yeah. going to realize whether or not we are being conformed into the image of Jesus. It's when we're going to realize there are still some unsubmitted areas of our life. It's one of the reasons that Paul says, hey, you need to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts as you were called together in one body and be thankful. Does that make sense? D, I mean, it's a serious Man, Yeah, it lands with me, dude. I mean, we've been preaching this on repeat, feels like, for about two years. But, I mean, we... I think we need to keep preaching this for the rest of our lives, yeah. man. This is one of the great calls, the reminders to us as believers. Like this is our kingdom call. Amen. Um, this Amen. is the ordinary call of every Christian, not just the extraordinary call of a few that go by the title pastor or elder or missionary. And this is what God's called us to. And, and he is the full source of equipping power to accomplish this through us, but like, man, this is it. This is the picture. And for those of 70 of you leaning in and listening tonight, like, yeah. listen, we, we can't go back to default. Nah, we, man. We can't the go global back. church can't afford to go back to normal. We can't go back to Sunday services and Wednesday night small group on campus only. Like, we need to become yeah. a people who link arms with brothers and sisters who live and work and play where we live and work and play. And we, we, we need to begin to gather around dinner tables and plead with God to give us a vision for how to love those who don't yet know the love of Christ. That's mm -hmm. how we're going to see the gospel saturate the Heartland region. And can I tell you, like, and I'm preaching this weekend and I'm going to say this again this weekend, like, folks, our neighbors still need the good news of Jesus, and the good news is still good news. We still need the good news of Jesus, even though so much has changed in this age of COVID. What yeah. hasn't changed is that the good news is still good. What has changed is the de delivery method, what it's supposed to look like. And so Paul is harping on relational intimacy and community. That's why the peace of Christ needs to rule. It's why the word of Christ needs to dwell richly in our hearts. That's why last week we unpacked what it means for us to let the word of Christ dwell richly and to dwell so richly in our hearts, verse 16, that what? We will be led to instruct one another, teach one another, admonish one another. Mm -hmm. We will begin to express this worship of our lives through lifting our voices in unison to making much of the name of Jesus. Folks, when, when we let the word of Christ dwell richly in our hearts, it will lead us to not only nurturing one another towards a growing relationship with Jesus and with one another, but we will also demonstrate lives of thanksgiving through singing out to God. That, that's what verse 16 tells us. Sing a spiritual hymn. Sing a, uh, sing a hymn. Sing a spiritual song. Sing out loud to Jesus. Uh, remember, the book of Psalms was the hymnal of the Old Testament saints. Psalm 125 to 134 were called the Psalms of Ascent, and they would sing them every year as they ascended up to the hill to the city of God for the festivals three times a year. The people of God have always been a singing people, as we are called to be a singing people as 
Well, and so this week, man, we find that Paul's going to take us a step further into this call of living a life of worship by painting with a really broad brush to remind us that all of life is worship. Yeah, man. All of life is worship. Uh, read, read for us, D. Let's let's dive in. Yeah. Colossians chapter three, verse seventeen, man. Verse seventeen says these words. This will be a, a passage of scripture worth memorizing. Amen. Um, and uh, says something similar in First Corinthians ten thirty one. If you want to just jot down a note in your Bible, First Corinthians ten thirty one has a very similar statement. But it says, "Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord of the Lord Jesus." Give thanks, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let me read that again. I messed that whole thing up. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Yeah, this is uh, I, next to that verse in my Bible. I have different references throughout the scriptures of uh, really of worship um, and how worship gets defined um, as I see it throughout the scriptures, this is definitely a, a call for the believer who is learning to let the peace of Christ to rule in their hearts, the word of Christ to dwell richly in them. Like those, when those things happen, like those roads are heading in the same direction, like the natural result is going to be worship. Amen. It's Amen. going to cause us to, in everything, in word and deed, to have, live a life of worship. Worship's a whole lot bigger than what happens Sunday morning when we break out a guitar and a drum kit. Yeah. Uh, worship, according to scriptures, was meant to be a lifestyle. Yeah. It was meant to be the posture of our heart. It was meant to be an attitude that we carry with us throughout the day. Um, sometimes it comes easy and natural um, because things happen. You're driving to work and you see a stunning sunrise. and Worship comes natural. Sometimes it comes natural because you're in a church service and they play your favorite song and it's your favorite singer on the worship team that sings it and worship in that moment comes natural. But the real stuff of worship, this kind of stuff that he's talking about right here happens. Um, the greatest opportunities for this worship is when it is less than convenient. When we need to be reminded that this is a word or this is a deed, or this is a moment where I can bring glory to God, even though it doesn't feel comfortable. That's why he's reminded them. And that's why we need to be reminded together tonight as well. Amen. Amen. You know, Paul is summing up all of chapter three right now. He's summing it all up. Like this is the apex of what the life of a Christ follower is. All of life is to be worshipped, whether in word or in deed, and is to be done in the name of Jesus. So let's let's kind of take this apart piecemeal. It's not a difficult verse to understand. It is a challenge to implement. So whatever you do, like we get that, right? Whatever you do, it's all encompassing. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, in declaration yeah. or in demonstration, everything you say, everything you do. So here's a question, rhetorical question, but a convicting question. Can you think of anything associated with your life that does not fall into one of those categories? Is there anything in your life that doesn't fall into word or deed? I mean, we know the answer. The answer is no. And, and so the natural conclusion is, so what then does it mean for us to live our lives in a way in which everything is done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's defining the context for us here, right? Our life in its entirety is, be, is to be lived out in the name of the Lord Jesus. One of the, one of the big significant implications of this then is that there is no longer any room for a kind of a, a sacred secular split, does that make sense? Like meaning we no longer get to compartmentalize our lives into church life and non-church life, right? Things I do for God and things I do for uh, myself. All of life is now to be lived out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. In a word, man, Paul is giving all of us the job description of what it means to be a son or a daughter of God. All of life is worship and it is to be worship done in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's let's camp out here. Get come to your keyboards. Want to ask you a question. What do you think it means then specifically to live out all of our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus? Mm. We understand that worship is to be a posture of our hearts, but specifically Paul qualifies this by saying word or deed, 
done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you think it means to live out all of our lives in the name of Jesus? I'll give you a second to kind of wrestle through that. You putting that question up on the screen there? I don't think I did, bro. Let me check. Hey, we'll make, we'll stay, uh, just say it one more time then. Yeah, the, yeah go to your keyboard. It's opportunity to respond and interact. What yeah. do you think that it means to live all of our lives in word or deed in the name of Jesus? There it is. Yeah, it's in the comments if you guys need, need it. What do you yeah, think it means you. to live our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus? You know, as you guys are writing that, there's a there's a lot in a name. You know, in modern society, we don't quite give attention to names the way the ancient world did. But the ancients, man, they held a man's name to be of utmost importance. Often in the Old Testament, God changed a person's name because of some important experience or some new development right. in their life. Abram to Abraham, Jacob to Israel, Simon to Peter, Saul no longer went by Saul after he met Jesus. He wanted to be called Paul, right? There's a power of sorts in a name. And in just a few minutes, you know, a person can disgrace a name that is, is taken his ancestors years to build. Uh, you know, uh, Aaron Burr will always be held in infamy for my Hamilton fans out there uh, because of what he did. Uh, and everything else about his story has been wiped away essentially uh you know that we got a few coming in okay well uh, what sorry we go ahead what do we got what well we got? melissa yeah melissa kicked it off right saying my love just love yeah man. love that it be a life saturated with love to act justly love mercy paul mm. seek first the kingdom of god Amen. love one another there yeah all things in christ's strength um, mm, to want to give up the fleshly form to take on the true desire and urge to love and live through the spiritual form. Yeah, yeah. We want to be dominated by yeah. the Spirit of Christ. We want to give expression to the life of Jesus and not gratify the desires of our old man that no longer is alive. Uh, live like Jesus did. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's a really good answer, to live like Jesus mm -hmm. did. Let's talk about let's talk about living all of life in the name of Lord Jesus. Here's here's a couple of thoughts. And you guys, you guys had some great things to say. And some of what I'll say will expand on some of that. Dustin, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as well. Uh, some of these thoughts I got straight from my father-in-law, who's a much better teacher than I am. I want to make sure I'm giving credit where credit is due. Uh, but first and foremost, to, to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus is to first and foremost acknowledge His authority. Okay? Like when we sign our name to a check, we are authorizing the withdrawal of money from our bank account, right? If the president signs his name on a bill, it makes it law. Jesus has authority, all authority, because he is Lord. God granted him the right, the power to rule in us. In other words, friends, we are called to the lordship of Jesus, meaning we are to submit everything we do and we say to his authority. And so living in the name of the Lord Jesus is in every moment, in every situation, submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. Mm. Here's another rhetorical question. Please don't answer. <laughs> what did you do today that you did not first submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And it doesn't need to be some critical gaffe on your part or some big sinful choice. I mean, you could again, you could have went back up to the lunch buffet one time too many, and you didn't ask for permission from the Spirit of your living God. You could have engaged a thought or an image and lingered longer at a place than you should have, that if you invited the Spirit into that decision, that choice, you would have known quite clearly that you were dead to that offer of darkness and that option needed to move in the other direction. Or you didn't step in and say what you should have said in that moment when you had an opportunity to speak life and truth and hope. See, because Jesus Christ is God and died for us, not only does he have all authority, but we also have authority in his name. Mm -hmm. You remember when Jesus sent out the 72 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits and over disease and over sickness. And this authority meant that everything that they did had to have been done in his name. It had his approval. It was according to the will 
of the Father, and all believers possess the authority of the name of Jesus. But, like, that does not mean it's a magic wand. It's not a formula that we just recite at any time to get what we want. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because authority takes on a different definition for the believer. Right? What does authority mean in our cultural context, Dustin? What comes to mind when you think of authority in our world today? Uh, man, I go, uh, I think of influence. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, some some people uh, have uh, an authority because of an election or authority because of uh, position or money. But bottom line is, it's whoever wields the influence wields the real authority. And sure. it's not always the person that's out in front and visible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's whoever's pulling the strings. You know? So so who's in charge? Right. Yeah. Right. Who's in charge? Yeah. Who, who's got the power? Who's got, you know, who's one in, way or another? Yeah. 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 Yeah, the authority sure. of Jesus in us is never going to look like in charge. It's going to look like servanthood. Yeah, amen. The authority of Jesus is the assurance that God honors and he blesses the life of Christ that is expressed in and through us. Our authority in Christ, hear me, our authority in Christ is his life expressed. His words spoken through us, his sacrificial life given up through us for the sake of other people. It's where we go without so that other people might have. And so like we learn to live in the authority of the name of Jesus, which is in other words, saying what Paul's been saying all along. It's learning to give expression to the life and the power of Jesus because where the life of Christ flows best, the authority of God rules most. And so we need to learn to live out of what is ours in Christ. And this goes back to the conversation we've been having for months. Like, you, you don't make a good Jesus, so stop trying. Jesus wants to be Jesus in you, as you, and through you. And he is the only sufficient and capable one of turning the other cheek, of letting peace rule, of going the second mile, of forgiving 70 times 7. And if you keep trying to do those things, you're going to wear yourself out. And for some of us... It's the love of God to let us wear ourselves out. Yeah, for sure. So, do all things in the name of Jesus. It's Mm -hmm. according to His authority. Here's another thought. Uh, To live all of our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus is, in essence, to act as His representative. Right? We are His ambassadors. We are His mouthpiece. We are His hands and His feet. We have called to be the, the, the body. We are created to be the body of Christ, called to be the body of Christ. As Christians, we bear the name Christ. You know the word Christians only found three times in the entire New Testament? It was originally a name of contempt given to those who belonged to the way, uh, but it became yeah. a name of great honor. And so the name of Christ, it means to be identified with Jesus and to belong to Jesus. So all that we say, all that we do should be able to be associated with the name of Jesus Christ. I've shared this question before. The next time before you do something or say something, here's a helpful uh, barometer. Can I stamp the name of Jesus upon this with no apology, with no Mm -hmm. justification, uh, with no rationalization? Can I stamp the name of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, the life and nature and character of Jesus? If not, then we're going to have a hard time living out the name of Jesus Christ. And that goes back to like when we act as a representative of Jesus, like we're acting in such a way that when the world looks at us, what we say and what we do, they get Jesus. Which I think we could learn a lot about this through, honestly, through contrast. Um, I would because mean? our uh, what I mean by that is, <laughs> right now, um, for many of us, our just kind of our natural disposition is we go into conversations, we go into situations, and the question that our soul is asking us is, how can I get this to work out of my benefit? Mm. Uh, how can I? essentially glorify myself through this? How can I make sure that this conversation leans my way? How can I make sure that this transaction goes my way? How can I make sure that this conflict ends up with me on top? Like that's the question we're always asking ourselves subconsciously at least. And what he's telling us right here is that those who have the peace of Christ dwelling in their heart, 
those who have the word of Christ dwelling richly in your heart, like this is yet another call for to change the question we're asking ourselves. When I go into the hard conversation, I'm now not concerned about glorifying myself. I'm asking, all right, Lord, like what best serves you in this? Yes. Because you're going to have to step into this one and have the conversation with me, through me and for me. Um, in this, in this transaction or in this conflict or in this, whatever, like it's allowing our, it's, it's teach, it's declaring to our soul. No, you're not going to, you're not going to ask me what glorifies Dustin in this. I'm going to, I'm going to ask the Lord, like what glorifies you in this? What celebrates you best in this? How do you, how does your name be made famous through this opportunity that I have or this promotion or this job or the purchase of this home? Um, and it, it really is, it's a paradigm shift. It transitions us from a place of, honestly, from a place that makes us vulnerable to defeat, depression, discouragement, doubt, and fear, because we're trying to always keep ourselves elevated. And that's an exhausting life. Mm -hmm. This verse reminds us to make the transition from a place of that self-worship to actual God worship. Amen. And allowing each one of these little things in our life to point to him, to elevate him, to lift up his name. And as I mentioned before, man, like verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be some easy stuff along the way. But the real worship opportunities happen in the hard stuff. When we have to remind ourselves or when we have to remind each other of this, I, my favorite definition of worship period in all the Bible Easy, easy to remember where this one is. Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. Second Samuel 24, 24. And this is King David um, bringing an offering before the Lord, and he shows up at his neighbor's house. And the neighbor, of course, just, just astonished that the king came to his house to offer an offering on his uh, threshing floor. He says, oh, king, let me let me provide for you the place to offer your offering and let me provide for you the sacrifice. Like, and what an honor to be able to give that to your King and King David's response rattled my cage. The first time I saw it, man, it defined for me what real worship looks like. He says, why would I bring before God that which costs me nothing? Second Samuel 24, 24. I bet you glorifying God and your word and deed today would have cost you something. It would have cost you. would had to lay yourself on the altar first and foremost. You'd had to present your body as a living sacrifice in order to honor God and word and deed today. Because it wouldn't have came natural and it wouldn't have came easy. There would have been times where you would have had to come to the altar and present a sacrifice that was costly because it was going to mean maybe not getting your way. It was going to mean having to choose to celebrate the Lord and elevate him instead of elevating yourselves. It, would have chew, it, it, it may have meant you keeping your mouth closed when you really wanted to say something. But it was all done for the glory of the Lord. It was all done out of an act of worship to him. This is what the, the, the writer of Hebrews tells us, that we would bring to the Lord a sacrifice of praise. I guess the same idea. That's in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Um, that scripture quote, but, but anyways, man, when I, when I land here in Colossians and see what Paul is driving home to the heart of the believer, man, it reminds me that great worship, it, it comes at a cost. Um, whereas we, uh, the American version of great worship is when we show up to church and they picked all the right songs that we love and we leave saying, man, worship was great today. Hmm. Or we leave because they didn't pick the right songs or they played them in the wrong key or they had the wrong person singing them. And we let and we leave saying, man, I didn't like worship today. You talking to yourself. What do you mean you, you like worship or didn't like worship? Like what would happen if folks walked into church on Sunday morning bringing worship with them? It would change everything. Yeah. Somebody asked me one time when I. Back when I toured leading worship, they said, what would happen if instead of coming to worship, the people of God came with worship? Mm. Man, it would transform our churches and our communities, man. It would it would be such a contagious experience, man, that people would want to be a part of the celebrating of God. Because, I, I mean, the, the freedom and truly worship in the Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. It would be just catalyst to healing in your life and healing in your marriage and healing in your heart and your emotions. And instead of 
you know, coming wanting to hear the right song, man, we came bringing a sacrifice of praise. And I'm going to hallelujah anyhow. The song ain't right. The tune ain't right. My day ain't right. My morning went wrong. But I'm going to bring a hallelujah anyhow. You know what I mean? What well, and, and God. Well, no, go ahead. You, you were, you were on fire. I telling personal stories, man. So what? when God really started to deal with me on this particular issue. Oh, am I, am I still up? If you want to, man, you was on fire. I didn't want to interrupt. Well, I, I mean, it strikes a chord with me because I, I, the Lord had kind of led me through a journey of that in my own life, man. The first encounter I had with God on worship was when I was way up in the mountains of West Virginia, man, going to college, playing football. And the, there was a school. Uh, there was a church right down the road from my school. It was a lot like Grace Bible, man. Just just a lively place, dude. Uh, and it was just it was exciting to be there. People were excited to be there. And it was just full of life, man. The, the sermons were great. The, not to say ours are, but the sermons were great. The worship was awesome. And it's like, man, that's where I wanted to be. Um, but for some reason, God kept, through a variety of circumstances, God kept showing me that the church I was supposed to serve at was this tiny little church called Tallmansville Baptist Church, way up in the hills. I mean, literally, this place was so country that our pastor was also the sheriff. All right. I ain't lying to you. <laughs> this place was full of love, man, just full of love, but like definitely not what you would consider thriving and vivacious. I mean, the lady that played the key, the the organ or the piano every morning, the piano was out of key. She sang out of key, dude. She was singing. I grew up on him. She sang hymns I never heard of in my life. And um, Man, it was just like, I was just missing something for me, you know? And I'm like looking over my shoulder like, man, this church back in town is so thriving. God kept telling me, no, here's where I want you. Here's where I want you. I'd sit back and just white knuckle the back row pew every week as I suffered through those hymns, man. And I was like, man, if these only people, if, if only these people knew what they're missing out, like what worship really was, man. And that's when God convicted me, says, this is what worship is, because this was God showing me that this was what worship was, man, because it, it, because it didn't come easy and it wasn't natural. And I couldn't just sit back and just enjoy the song and honestly get to enjoy just listening to myself sing. It, it required that I worship God, that I paid attention to the words, man, that I really brought an offering of praise, man. And um, that was, God started to deal with me about that, man. I changed the way I worship. And so now when even our worship team sings a song that I don't like, um, I will intentionally try to worship even more, uh, more concerted because I know that that is a great opportunity for me to bring an offering of worship to the Lord. Anyway, well, I could go on about that for an hour. I've got other stories too, but yeah, I, I appreciated you, uh, kind of sharing your definition of worship from second Samuel 24. I uh, my, I have a definition of worship that's similar to that. It comes out of Romans eleven thirty six and right into Romans twelve one. And I didn't plan on sharing this, but Romans eleven thirty six essentially is kind of like a doxology. It's it's Paul's kind of crowning the first eleven chapters of Romans before he transitions the entire book to the practical application, the the what now of all the doctrine in Romans one through eleven. Mm -hmm. And eleven thirty six is this: for from him and to him and back through him to God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so I've, I've become to understand that worship is one glory, Romans eleven thirty six, 36. Mm -hmm. And then chapter 12, verse one, therefore I urge you brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. This is your spiritual service of worship. Sacrifice. What is worship? It is glory and sacrifice. Glory yeah. is giving to God the glory that He's due, the worth, the value, ascribing to Him what is His. Remember that word glory? The Greek word is doxa, and it means that which makes God impressive. 
It's where we get our mm-hmm. word doxology from, the Hebrew word for glory is kavod, and it speaks of the weightiness of God. The glory of God was in the Shekinah fire, the cloud by day and fire by night where the presence of God dwelt. Remember when Solomon dedicated the temple and the glory of the Lord came into the temple, the, the, the presence of God was so thick that the priests couldn't stand. They fell on their knees and to the ground. Why? Because the glory of God was about the weightiness of God. And so glorifying God is giving God the worth that he is due. It is ascribing Mm -hmm. him his value. But sacrifice, Romans 12 verse 1, is the costliness of giving God of what is his due. Amen. And we, man, we sacrifice for things that we worship all the time, don't we? Like, Uh, we, we, I think that's the nail on the head. Yeah. We will sacrifice for whatever it is that we worship. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Mm, Say it again. We will sacrifice for whatever it is that we worship. You show me the things that you make the greatest sacrifices for, and I'll show you what your God is. Amen. That's where you worship. You know, that's all of us, which is, man, brings me to the question that might be a good place for interaction. I know that we're kind of rounding out our last few minutes here. So stop me if you had some. Okay. Yeah, my question would be, let's go to the comment section right here. Um, you may have to help me frame this up in words. Brain's getting a little foggy. Um, my question would be for all of us to respond to here in the comment section is, uh, what, are, what, are some, what are some practical ways that you um, can worship God in such a way that you're not the beneficiary of your worship? That's a long way to ask the question. What am I trying to say? Uh, what are some um, ways that we can worship God so that it's not about us, but it's about Him? There you go. Yeah, like totally about Him. Uh, case in point, I gave you an example before. Like, it's fun to worship God singing the songs that we like, um, for example. But what's some like real time, real life, practical <clears throat> ways of glorifying God and bringing a sacrifice of praise to Him that? are not serving, that is not serving you at all. I got, I got one for you already. Not self-serving at all. Uh, Far away in the comment section there. Yeah, I've got one as well. Uh, We'll give you a minute. What are some practical ways that we can worship God so that it is really not about us? In any way, you have no benefit from it whatsoever. It really is an offering. And, and I mean, let's be honest Lord. though, man, like there has never been a time when I have genuinely authentically worshiped God and not been a recipient of great grace, great mercy, oh, yeah. a great There's... sense of his joy and love and peace and patience on my heart. Um, but yeah, man, but like I will say that there is there was a season in my life that there was a way that God was calling me to worship that was anything but satisfying sure. for me. I didn't walk away thinking, all right, man, I sure did enjoy worship today. Like I it like when God would prompt my heart to do this thing, it was it was driving me up the wall. Sure. But I knew, like Lord, this is this is my offering of worship to you right now, and you are worthy of every ounce of energy it requires of me. There it's, were, it's silly. I, I'll tell y'all about it in a second. Super ridiculous. I had three but, years of working at uh, one of the best places in our town, the Highlands County Tax Collector's Office, and which, I love my brother Eric's wear passionately but i stunk at that job and it was outside of my wheelhouse and my brother was just serving me and giving me a job and man i bro i wept there were days where i wept because i knew that's what it that wasn't what i was created to do but it was what i needed to do in that season of life in order to get me to the place where i could do what i knew god had called me to do and man it work was worship in those days even through gritted teeth, man, and wiping my tears off as I fixed my tie and grabbed my lunchbox and walked yeah. into the door. You know? That's a good one, man. Um, we got some really good ones, man. Yeah, really good ones. Yeah. I, there's a few that I missed because they scrolled down while you were talking, and I can't see the full thing. Well, so. I can. Uh, Mary Jacob says, with our time to, to serve others. Yeah, I love that. Skip, yeah. man, you're right. Dedication to daily prayer, like a consistency. Uh, a consistent listening for God's voice so that we can get our marching orders from Him. Jennifer, in our prayer closet, giving our all to where it yeah, brings us to a place of tears. Sabrina, worship Him even when you don't feel like it. I, I, I think that is, 
I, I think that is a sweet, sweet aroma to the Father. Uh, uh, I believe it, yeah. Knowing that we're pressing when, in and we don't feel like it. When you can truly and genuinely celebrate the glory of God, and yeah, and you just, and but you're not like your your emotions haven't caught up to that, but you're doing it anyway. You want with a really unique, heart. you want a really unique and powerful picture of that. Go to, go to, go to First Samuel chapter one, and look at Hannah as she yeah. worships and praises God, even though she's not promised to Samuel. No, nah, well, hey, man, Job chapter one, man, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord, Amen. man. That's a picture of sacrificial worship. Amen. Amen. Some good. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, leaving our comfort zones. Yep. 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 Give up our personal special quiet time to serve someone. You know, Jose, let me piggyback off that. Uh, my mentor, Pastor Steve Pettit, you've met yeah. him. He says, one of the ways we worship God with it not being about us is something he calls secret service. Mm. Secret service. Find somebody to go serve and don't tell nobody about it as much as you want to tell somebody about it. Yeah, right. That's good. <laughs> I said, well, I said, give me, give me an example of one in your season of life. He said, well, I'm not doing this anymore, so I can talk about it now. But I go to the old folks' home and I clip toenails. My man, wow! And wouldn't tell anybody about it, and I just listen to folks tell me stories so that they had that dwarf's just... mind, dude. That dwarf's <laughs> mind. Clipping toenails. Come on now. <laughs> Hey, one of y'all needs to hear the word of the Lord and go start clipping toenails as an act of worship. <laughs> what about Jose you, man? Silva says, cool. Go ahead on, Jose. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, what you got? Oh, what man. you got, Dustin? Ooh, ooh, Jarvis says, loving our enemies and forgiving those that offend us. Let's go. That's costly. That's gospel. Woo! That's worship. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm forgiving this person. I'm loving this person. Even though I have nothing to gain from it, but this is all because it is to the glory of God, man. That's worship Ephesians right there, 4, dude. Ephesians four thirty two: Be kind and tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ mm. has forgiven us. Yeah, that is a powerful act of worship that Amen. that activates the heart of God because it is the heart of God. Yeah, it is. Yeah. that's exactly what He did. Mm. That is who He is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that's good. Yeah, well, I mean, since I made a big deal about it, I got to share. You got to tell us, man. Though, We're well, all on the edge of our seat. It dwarfs in comparison to some of yeah. what these guys are sharing, you know. So, uh, I did. I went through this weird season of my life. It was, I, well, appropriately, it was when I was uh, touring, leading worship in churches around the country. So, I mean, multiple times a week, here I am leading worship services with music, and it had lost its flare. I mean, when you sing how great is our God now for the 373rd time, like it's, it, it doesn't have the zing to it uh, anymore, you know? And so you're having to just be conscientious about I'm offering this worship to you, even though I'm not feeling this song right now. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, God started dealing with me and it was this weird thing. Like it, I would start, I started noticing and it was never in a convenient place. I would start noticing garbage. <laughs> For real. Like, you know, sitting in the parking lot, like about to pull out, you jump in your vehicle, you're about to leave. And I would see not, not nearby, not on the way to my vehicle. I would see clear across the parking lot, a piece of trash. And the conviction of the Lord would settle upon me. Wow to go pick up that piece of garbage and throw it away. It was such a, a strange season in my worship life, but that was the way that God had called me to worship and not to pick up every piece of trash that I saw. Okay, because like, can would, I tell you, like, I'm like trying to think of ways I can throw trash I'm out you, when I'm around you. He would a double mint gum wrapper, <laughs> the aluminum foil one, tin foil, and it would, there would be a glint off the sunlight. And I would catch it in my eye all the way across the parking lot, and I would have to not drive over there. My offering of worship was to go and pick that thing up and throw it in the trash and just praise the Lord the whole time. Thankful for the earth that he had given us. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, like that was a time in my life where God was shaping and molding my sacrificial worship to remind me, man, it is worship is more than a song, man. It is a, it is as David said, man, it is an offering that costs me something. Yeah. And, um, and so, man, the examples you guys are giving are fantastic as well. And so I would, man, 
I mean, one, you know, one of the prayers I pray now oftentimes in my morning quiet time is, Lord, however you would want to be worshipped through my life today, Lord, I pray that you uh, would make that clear to me, that you would uh, that you would show me and live that out through me. So, Listen, when we're yielding to the Lordship of Jesus, we can always trust that the life of Christ in us is able to respond rightly in a way that will always honor His name. We need to be rooted and anchored to the source, nurturing our love affair with Jesus so that when we find ourselves in those circumstances, we are able to let Jesus express himself and live his life through us. Why is this important, understanding that all of life is worship? Because we're going to need to remember that when we get into verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1, in the relationships of marriage, husband and wife, verses 18, 19 parents, children, verses 20, 21, uh, employers, employees, masters, slaves, bond servants, all of these different relationships that we need to learn to live to the glory of God, to lay down our demands and to look with love instead of looking for love. And it happens when we understand that all of life is to be lived, whether in word or in deed, to the glory of God. Yeah. Amen. Right. So I think probably the best way to end this discussion, man, is to read that verse once more. Oh, I thought um, you I, were going to sing another hymn like last week. Cause... Uh, you know, we're talking about worship being everything but music right now. So maybe we... But every one of your examples had to do with music tonight. So I'm just... I, I, no, they did <laughs> I'm not. just playing. Did. <laughs> read the passage. Read the passage. So I would encourage you, beloved, and I would encourage you to memorize this uh, passage, this verse right here. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We love y'all. Amen. Yeah, we love y'all. Hope to see you this weekend, 8.30, 10, and 11.30 in person at GBC. 10 o'clock will be live streamed as always. We love you guys, and we look forward to seeing you there as well as next week right here. See y'all. Bye.